Welcome to class. Today, I would like to get started on our discussion of Karl Marx's Capital, a critique of political economy, and that will keep us busy all week. So today, I want to start with the basics. Um, all wealth in a capitalist society presents itself as a mass of commodities. So the basic unit of analysis that we're dealing with is the commodity. This is an item of economic interest, something that can be bought, sold, something that can be made, something that is made in order to be sold, um, that will be bought, but somebody has a need for it that it satisfies. If you start reading capital, all these definitions will be provided within the first paragraph. So what is Marx doing here? He is operating like a scientist, just like perhaps the chemist will start with a molecule or the element and the biologist starts with a cell so here, in the analysis of a commodity-producing society or critique of political economy, we start with the basic unit. And that basic unit that everything else hinges on is the commodity. So um, we're looking at a particular place and time. In other words, other than sciences that might claim to uncover basic eternal truths that are always the case. We are looking at a society, in Marx's words, where the capitalist mode of production dominates, where things are being made and sold and bought because of a profit mode, because somebody, in order to meet your needs, you have to buy something in Marx. Not all societies are like there are many societies that have a marketplace. Medieval societies certainly had markets. They had a money economy as well. But what they didn't have was that they were a commodity producing society. Primarily, people produced things based on need. They did so in ways that was embedded in a traditional order that determined how people saw what they did, not as something you may merely did as a job, but as a calling, as something you were born into, as a duty, whether performed gladly because you thought you helped other people and please God, or um, because you had to, since you owed it to your Lord and to your master. But it was not a society where people produced commodities primarily in order to sell them in spite of the fact that you have a money economy. And of course, there are some people who are in such a society engaged in buying and selling things. But usually they do this um, long distance, in a segment of the market, they do it for arbitrage, in other words, they don't exchange things in value, but they buy cheap to sell beer, and they don't determine the nature, the character of the entire economy by doing this. So, of course, there's sophisticated world trade, accounting, uh, merchant banking and whatnot uh, in the Renaissance, in the Middle Ages and further back. But it's not a capitalist society. Um, the further away you move from the ports, the further then from the cities, the more you get into the countryside, the more you're looking at Households that function more or less on a subsistence level, on a high level, certainly, but that don't really require market exchange for most things. So um, a capitalist society is one where increasingly all needs are met in commodity form. Whatever you wish for, whatever you have to have to meet your needs is going to become it's going to come to you in commodity form. You buy it on the market. This doesn't have to be, this is not about 
specific things that meet specific needs. In other words, he isn't talking about, say, uh, just food or housing or clothing. And it is not involving any kind of moral judgment, stuff that is useful versus stuff that is pointless or frivolous. Anything that somebody is willing to pay a price for and that serves them particular need that they can satisfy themselves is a commodity. No, again, no value judgment allowed. So at some point in capital, he gives an example of a um, pious carpenter, I think, who sells a table and then takes the money to buy the Bible for the family because the old one is getting kind of frayed. And then the Bible salesman, I think, hires a loose woman. So it's like, there is, it's all the same. In the, in the marketplace, it is all just one good is as good as another. One need is as good as another. The point is you cannot satisfy it yourself. You need somebody else to do it for you. And then they need to offer it in the market where to exchange to get your hands on. So that's commodity. If you were to look up commodity um, in the dictionary or online, you might find a definition out of modern day economics, where they talk mostly about bulk goods, primarily agricultural when it comes to commodities. But in the, in the commercial parlance of the 19th century, as well as from the, um, from the German translation, Ware, um, where you will recognize the similarity, the relation to an English word, where, wares, you know, to bring your wares to market. So that means anything that is bought and sold. It can get increasingly complex, like in the uh, run-up to the 2008 economic crash, for instance, a hot commodity was a collateralized debt obligation that bundled um, bets on the development of the value of insurance policies taken out against mortgages that had been given, that had been uh, issued to low-income families on a subprime interest rate basis so that they could buy McMansions in Fresno or Las Banos or Stockton. And the whole edifice, where in the end you have like, this hot commodity of the CDO, the collateralized debt obligation, rested on a foundation of straw or sand. Um, but that doesn't matter. You buy this specific thing, you sell it, um, it is an item in the market, and it serves a purpose there. until it doesn't. And then, of course, you know, you get a credit. The commodity has two aspects. Each commodity has both of these aspects. One is the use value. And the other is the exchange value. So what you re recognize here, of course, we've been talking a lot about Hegel and the way he thinks about the material and the spiritual, the abstract and the concrete. The commodity has these two determinations to its concept. It has something concrete that is bound to the material, it's the use value, and it has something abstract that is tied to its exchange, and that's the exchange value. One is numerical or monetary, quantitative. The other is entirely qualitative. So when you have a sandwich. Let's see if I can de detonate this all the way through. Um, picture a sandwich. Have you had lunch? It's one o'clock. Um, good. You haven't had lunch. So, yeah. Fantasize about food for a moment. Yeah. Your favorite sandwich. Yes? Um, now, like, how can you get your hands on them? There is, of course, various places on this campus that sell them. Say you can go to a I'm not going to endorse any um, specific ones, but imagine there's a sandwich shop 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking about something specific here. A sandwich shop uh, that sells this and you go there, you buy it, and then you have it. So what happens now? The exchange value for your, for all practical purposes, um, you paid the price. That's your exchange value right there. Um, it's not identical with it and it's derived, but just like to illustrate it here, the price. And then you have um, a dubious collection of code cuts and other things that you can um, that you can now call your own. This is yours. What is the use value of the sandwich? Nutrition. You have a need for that, which is why you acquired this commodity and why the shop sold it. Um, the nutrition of the sandwich exists, the nutrition value of the sandwich exists only in potentiality. It must be actualized. It is actualized only through the process of its consumption. And thus becomes the reality. Again, you're recognizing um, the Hegel in all these ideas. And at that point, it has fulfilled its purpose. It is gone. It is an eaten sandwich. It has satisfied your need. It has lived up to this, its purpose. The use value has been realized. But in its realization, it vanished. It is now gone. So this is the concrete site. And that is designated to vanish. The exchange value, however, um, has shed its physical form. It has transitioned, metamorphosed through this physical form in the moment of exchange. Or, in other words, the sandwich shop now has your money. And there, it will, this value will continue. This looks like wealth. It's supposed to spell value. Let me make this clearer. Um, still not right. But anyway, so the value, the value uh, continues to have a life of its own in the, the money form that goes on to engage in economic activity. And in fact, um, it will easily exchange back and forth into its material form, into its money form and back. So um, nevertheless, in order for any of this to work, it, it needs to be tied to the use value. You cannot have a commodity without use value. So imagine you buy the sandwich, you have it in your hand, you're about to eat it and then you trip and you lose it and it falls to the floor face down both sides. What happened with the use value? Will you still eat it? Depends on how desperate you are <laughs> um, and how robust your stomach is. But really, for most purpose, for most people and practical purposes, that's it. The use value is gone, even though you didn't consume it. Now, of course, not every sandwich um, is going to be bought. You might be frugal and you might make your own at home. Same ingredients, because you really like the way they do it. They're slightly wilted lettuce you know, ever so um, almost expired salad sauce and stuff. And you put that together, you put it into your refrigerator and you're going to go home to eat lunch today uh, because you don't want to stand in line. You have enough fun with the sandwich. So you arrive there and the sandwich exists in all its beautiful use value potentiality for you. It is not a commodity at all, right? Because um, you didn't, you made it with your own label. You're not buying it, you're not selling it. Um, and you open the fridge and it's not there. Turns out your housemate ate it. So the US value was realized, except not for your purpose. This also illustrates an additional point that we get to, to uh, find is definitional very early on, that the US value does not require labor or its appropriation. In other words, if you didn't make it and you use it, you still have it. And that's the end of it. You didn't get paid for it. Um, so the use value, just think of the material properties of the thing. There's a lot that can happen with it. But in the marketplace, the point of it is to be exchanged. So uh, at any time, at all times, these things need to go together. There are some things that are border cases, right? There are things that have use value without having exchange value. In the case that happens, the market 
based commodity producing society will find ways to try and change that. But Marx gives as examples use value without exchange value, virgin soil, air, water. Stuff that's there for you to use that you didn't have to work for and that nevertheless satisfies the need. But it doesn't have an exchange value. Nobody worked for that you didn't have to work for. It. They're now bottling water and selling it. So that the water, if you drink the water anywhere without treatment, uh, you're probably going to be choked with microplastics on a molecular level pretty soon. So that's no longer the case. In the 19th century, that was the um, Soil also, I mean, the same issue. The natural environment is no longer that which we had in the 19th century, which in a way, in a second twisted way, confirms Marx's whole approach that really nature is already always the, the product of the social and, and or species metabolism with nature, the labor process that alters. It. So it's never really just um, unaltered. So that's mostly what we need to know about these things. It is important to keep in mind that both of these need to belong together um, in order for there to be a real commodity that lives up to its definition. Another example is you're the sandwich shop owner you made a bunch of sandwiches ahead of time, but you do not sell them, and they go bad. They just sit there, nobody buys them, and that's it, you have to toss them. You might still, if, depending on how much of a social conscience you have, you might give them away for a homeless person. To. Uh, but that does, usually people don't do that because they think it's gonna drive down the price or it's going to help hold them liable or whatever. In the pandemic, People were burning food, you know, once again, like in the 30s and the Great Depression, when people were going hungry at the same time that there were like mountains of grain set on fire to fix the prices, um, to stabilize the prices. So use value that can realize its exchange value may have belonged to a commodity at one point, but that can also end without a sale by this way by expiration so to speak so um how do we know how much to pay for it what how do we we know exactly what use will get out of it and it might vary it might be individually or culturally different um if you have a you know a liverwurst sandwich I can't believe they discontinued that stuff now <laughs> um, just figure out how to make it without killing people but um if they have, if you have a liverwurst sandwich and you bring it to a faithful Muslim or Jewish country, you do not have a commodity. You have an item that is prohibited uh, to most people there and you won't sell it. Um, if you have an allergy against any of the things on that, and um, you know, then also it won't satisfy the need, but that doesn't call into question the basic definition because remember, the use value lies in the use that the person who buys it and wants it has for it. So if you don't have that use because you can't eat it or you're not allowed to, it's not your commodity. But doesn't that doesn't matter? It's not somebody's commodity. So how? But we know about the use value. But what about, what about the exchange value? How do we know how much to pay for it? That's a mystifying thing. People will say, "Oh, you know, inflation and." price gouging, and then there is like war here and oil fields there. And so this is where really a thorough analysis might actually be the most necessary because money is so mystifying in prices. So how does a thing acquire its exchange value? At the first stage of this whole enterprise of analyzing the commodity and its concept, all we can say is um, that in a barter system, for instance, your housemate who ate your sandwich might give you something in exchange. Like what would you consider legitimate? Or let's say a case of beer. And then you get a whole case of it. So um, that compensates you for it. And here exactly we have the level of 
basic economic activity that Marx initially analyzed. It's communal. This would be in a, in a shared flat. For him, it's like in the village or in the tribe, but you have an exchange of, um, what do you call that? Like, um, of goods in kind, in exchange in kind. Um, so you're good. You have a sense that the beer is probably about as, as much worth as the sandwich. But if you go back to a communal uh, system, an economic system of independent producers, which is the exercise for all political economy to go with that assumption as, a, as the primal state. You have one person who specializes on raising livestock because that they have the facilities for that, that's what they're good at. You have another person who's um, raising chickens because maybe they don't have that much space, but they're really focusing on that, so they're successful doing that. And everybody in the village has their role and function. So in the end, you have two different And this is going to answer the long asked question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So um, you have two different farmers and one produces um, milk in the tetra pack and the other one uh, that's from the cattle, right? And the other one has like the chickens and I cannot, let's, let's say this is an egg carton with four eggs and it has three rows, so it's 12 total, a dozen eggs. Um, and then both, produce these things, they have need for that, and they satisfy that need through exchange. And nothing more is required. Like once you get to the market, the commodity with the, its two aspects doesn't really add much to it. It is still based on this basic exchange of um, milk or eggs in the wider economy of a village. Um, so how do these two things compare? Both sides assume that it's a fair deal. The fairness, and here we return to early in the class, you have the two standards that Aristotle had, um, one of which is the equivalent exchange, which hit for tat, and the other one is the um, what um, the comp compensatory or whatever, like the where you assume that people um given things to meet their needs, right? So this is that kind, the equivalent. Justice is if it's all even steel. So the farmer and the farmers know roughly how much work went into raising the chicken so that you can get a dozen eggs out of them versus how much work went into making this gallon of milk. That unless you're dealing with cultishly, religiously overdetermined items, you know, that acquire more symbolic value. If it's really just about the practical side, you're going to get this stuff from somebody who can make it better and more quickly than you, but you're still comparing as the basis for the exchange, how much time it costs the other person to do. And that's how it's evil. Uh, even, sorry. Um, so the Assumption then is here is an equivalent exchange that even if you put the price on both things, even if, say, your neighbor who has the chickens doesn't need milk today, so you take the milk to market and you sell it for cash, um, it is still going to be sold there for something in the large development of the market that has cost as much time for the person who made it to produce than what you, uh, what you expended for it. And what really happens is the value represented by, equal value represented by these two sides of the equation that is immediately short-circuited if you barter them, all that happens if you take it to market is that now it gets suspended in this money form. You take money when you sell the milk, you take that home, and then you can do with it whatever you want. So you have the use value that you realize, that you don't realize, the drinker of the milk realizes. But you have um, realized the exchange value, you take that home, and now you have it. So what this, what essentially happens here is nothing more than through the intervention of money, some means of exchange, 
the transaction is stretched in time and space. So that's all there is to it. In the conversion of money to commodity and vice versa, all that you do is you don't have to barter everything on the spot, but rather you can wait, you can bundle, um, like if you have a big coin you get, you can buy two different things for it and get change for it. So it just means you don't have to actually break everything down to the egg or the, or the milk. There are, of course, and in American history, as an aside, that that is a um, politically relevant thing in the Whiskey Rebellion. There are money commodities that served the purpose of money, like Whiskey did in Western Pennsylvania in the 1780s, when Hamilton went and uh, taxed it at the source for still the reason people produced whiskey from their corn was because to market the corn across the Appalachians on the East Coast would have eaten up all the profits through the transportation. But if you could refine it into something, low bulk, high value added um, whiskey, then you can actually profitably take it to Philadelphia and sell it and go on with your commercial farming, even though you're very, very far from the commercial center. And because that is so, you don't actually have to take the whiskey to Philadelphia. You can just take it to Pittsburgh, or even just the nearest town over, where there's an intermediary who will already give you cash for the whiskey. And then they will bundle it and take it, and that makes the whole process even more efficient. But what that also means is that everybody knows if you have whiskey, you can always go and take it to somebody, the nearest town over, and you can convert it into cash, which means you can treat the whiskey as cash. And so it became the cash commodity, um, the means of exchange in Western Pennsylvania. And then sometimes, you know, it dropped out of circulation because somebody drank it. Sometimes it was sold and actually brought to market. Um, but it never was just whiskey that you buy and sell to drink it, but it always had like, um, it was like a, a sort of anchor of the whole economic system. You don't always need cash. Uh, people don't have as much specie in circulation. That's another thing, like you don't actually have coins. It's like a bunch of Spanish coins that you have to draw on. There's never enough to, to really settle all outstanding transactions, so it serves a purpose. But money and whiskey share many necessary properties when it comes to serving as money commodities. Why? Because you can easily test if it's the real thing. With gold and silver, even copper, it is relatively easy to make sure that what you have there is the real metal. Even more so if it's minted with the government, you know, uh, stamp of approval and verification. Same with the whisk, you can smell it, um, you can look at it and see the, uh, the texture and the translucency of it and whatnot. You could even drink a little sip uh, to make sure it's the real deal. You can combine and divide it at will. I mean, when you're dealing with actual minted species, you, are, you already have your divisions set, but nothing keeps you from actually trading in gold bars that you melt down and then really divide by grams and, and, and micrograms and what. Same as with the whiskey that you can um, deal in by gallon or barrel or thimble. So in many ways, and they also don't go bad. If properly stored, the whiskey will keep forever. It doesn't really spoil. It will evaporate if you don't cork it um, or, or put a wax seal on it. So, but give, other than that, it spoils just as little as the coins. So you see there is actually, um, initially, money is really just a convenient stand. It could be something else, but it is nevertheless a distinct economic function and it represents something that is more than just the commodity itself. So money, the money commodity has still a use value. You can drink the whiskey in order to get drunk, or you can use it for disinfection purposes. You can make jewelry or 
of specialty tools or whatever out of the metal that defines on it. However, if you do that, it no longer functions as a means of circulation, as a money commodity. So, and while it does that, while it functions as a money commodity, it is the, the stand-in for an abstraction. And that abstraction is the exchange value. Um, so, because of this slippage or, you know, these things exist in such close proximity, there is a tendency to confuse gold for money or gold for value. And to assume, say, that only gold has real value and then everything else, like there's a theory that says money that is backed by government isn't, isn't real because it is, um, you know, just invented out of thin air. Paper money, the first generations of Jeffersonians in this country, Jefferson, Jackson, and um, Taylor of Caroline, who was the economist who influenced both of them, um, all basically thought that paper money was fraudulent and only real gold and silver have true value. The point here is, however, that nothing has true value. The value a money commodity represents is the value that the commodity has by virtue of being exchangeable um, and somebody will take it. But you could take little wooden blocks or whatever. You know, you could you can take Bitcoin for all I care. Um, and that clearly has no use value in that office. So um, as you see, nothing is, it doesn't diminish this process if you take paper money. If you have somebody who backs it as legal tender and says, regardless where you show up with this little piece of paper, it will be con considered worth $1. That of course wasn't given in the early Republic, right? Like banks issued paper money, government didn't. So if you had a $20 bill, from the first merchant's bank of New York on Broadway, and you went three blocks up and you tried to cash it there, they would give you $19 for it. If you wanted 20, you had to go to the exact bank that issued. And if you somehow ended up with that bank note in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, miles away from New York, they might give you 10. So there is no such thing as just face value unless it's legal tender and the government backs it and says, yes, this is $20 regardless. So um, that is one reason why legitimately people were suspicious of paper money. Often it was really not worth much, but not because the government was involved, but because the government was not involved. So, but as soon as, like, once you realize what's happening, that value is a thing. You can eat, you can drink, you can touch, it doesn't have any material substance, but yet it is a real thing. Um, that you realize that money that represents it, of course, has a substance. It has something that it represents a function in the exchange process, um, even though it is not material. Or the material side is irrelevant. So what you have then when the exchange value starts to become and be treated independent from the use value, what happens is that you're dealing with just plain value. Um, it derives from exchange value. It doesn't really exist without commodities being in circulation, but cons and it therefore cannot exist without having use value involved somewhere. But conceptually and in economic system, it takes on a life of its own. Um, so the exchange value becomes something that um, in the form of money, in the financial system, in the minds of people, takes on a life of, of its own. So what is it? Where does it come from? Um, we have the eggs that we exchange for the milk. And we know they're both worth the same thing because they are being exchanged as equivalents. So they're worth the same amount of money, they have the same value. Um, and we know that under a given system of production where it takes both sides the same amount of time to produce them, that value is going to be the same. Um, so what that resolves itself into then is the labor time. 
there's a determination of the magnitude of value based on labor time. Marx is saying, we don't know this, but we act on that assumption. By the time that people figure out that what determines value is the labor time, we've been doing it for generations, so it appears like a natural thing. But it is thanks to Adam Smith and his, in, his investigation in the wealth of nations that we have arrived at the labor theory of value and that we now know scientifically that value is based on labor time. Um, it is not, in other words, you know, if you boil down, if you boil this down to the molecular level, you will not find value. Um, and it also involves a certain absurdity because once they're sold, all that is left of them is the same thing who have exactly the same amount of value. So on the one hand, you can say, materially speaking, as use values, these are not identical. But as exchange values, they are identical. Uh, so milk equals eggs. And, and yet you cannot substitute one for the other in the recipe. Um, so it is, a, it is a real thing, the value is, but it is not a material. Um, it exists. Not inherently. There is nothing about eggs that inherently gives them value. It exists because of the social practice carried on customarily, habitually, historically, where people meet their needs by producing things and exchanging. Therefore, this is a practice that allows us to say value is an assumption that people make that these things have. If for some reason we made we met our needs differently, if you move into science fiction territory, I don't know if you watched the Orville, um, where they have matter synthesizing. All you have to do is like give me five hundred cigarettes and boom, <laughs> there they are. Um, that would of course render the concept of value meaningless. So they basically have an advanced techno socialist uh, society in that show. Um, but as long as people meet their needs in this fashion, and it involves um, labor, it involves learning, and all that stuff, that's going to be the basis for these exchanges. So um, value doesn't contain any material. One of the things you might ask is, and this is an objection that Marx um, addresses also early on, one of the things we might ask is, wait, labor time determines value, and there's a direct correlation. The more the labor time, the higher the value. What if somebody is really slow? What if I'm a completely incompetent carpenter or farmer or whatever, and I produce one table and it takes me two weeks? Somebody who knows what they're doing produces four tables in one week. Um, so does that mean I get paid eight times as much for my table, which is probably even less uh, well made because I don't know what I'm doing? No, absolutely not. It is not individual labor time that matters. What matters is the socially necessary average labor. So if a competent carpenter can make a table at the customary pace of work, which is a moving target, admittedly. Um, there's a speed up involved, the more things become commodified and capitalized. But at any given point in time, there, if you walk into a carpenter's workshop and you're a carpenter, you know if somebody is being uh, lazy or diligent. So average time needed with the knowledge technology, <clears throat> tools available at the time in a given society. And these are boundaries that expand or contract. If you put up a tariff, for instance, that says you can't have the goods from that country with a more advanced technology. Britain, for instance, is the first country with a textile industry. 
and is for about 30 years the only country with a tax on it. So um, that means a piece of cloth, a yard, a yard of linen or whatever, you know, um, produced in England is going to be cheaper than anywhere else because they make it on a machine and everywhere everywhere else. I mean, it's also a machine, but it's like by human legs with the help of a, of a loom. So um, the point of comparison, if you're looking at the world society with free trade, the lowest common denominator, the value of linen is determined by the fastest, most technologically advanced way of making. Um, but if you're putting up a tariff barrier, for instance, then it might still be a matter of looking at how long it takes a weaver in Silesia in their cottage to make. Um, in the 19th century, our free trade is more or less the, the norm. Um, so, what that also means is that his, in the historical process, the value of stuff drops dramatically, practically overnight, with the introduction of um, powered machines, like water power that drives looms. Um, that is then the moment of comparison. Or when Henry Ford introduces the production flow system, the conveyor belt, the process broken down into individual hand movements versus the artisanal automobile manufacturing process of somebody like Daimler, um, who's basically doing uh, it as an artisanal project. So um, the car is going to cost what, however much it costs for it to make, comes up in time. Then if somebody else catches up to you, and also acquires the technology and the machines and the skilled workers to work it, um, you, the first one who innovated, is going to feel uh, the pull of that. You, you were basically um, taking in a windfall for the time being. And that happened to Carnegie with the steel making. Once others caught up on the Bessemer process, he, um, he suddenly felt the pinch. The same happened to Ford with the um, production flow process. And um, the auto industry is a great example for that. Um, auto. So time is also the necessary average time is a moving target. Like where are the boundaries of the society that we're comparing it in? What's, what's the technology available and needed? Um, so if you have two things that you compare, and at a certain um, amount of, let's go with commodity A and B, they both take the same amount of time to make. Um, and so the equivalence. And then through innovation, the commodity A is the production the duration, the labor time required is cut in half. So then you would get two B in exchange at the normal time, at the same time, because B is still being made in the same fashion. But if, on the other hand, uh, this production process is at the same time also cut in half, the exchange of one for the other, A for B, would remain the same, except the actual value would be half, which we would only find out if you compare it to a third commodity, C, or in that, that case, uh, to money. Both will get cheaper. So this is the basic setup. And then, of course, once you know what value, money is simply what represents. So um, it is not a symbol. It is not a convention. It is not something that is set. And here you see how the exercises of talking about how a concept requires validity might come in handy. It is none of these things uh, that you might say if you have a social constructivist or onto, um, ontological approach. No, the reason there is money is because it fulfills a necessary function in an existing social process that calls for money to exist. And it has the function there of being means of exchange 
storage of value, um, you know, settlement of accounts, all those kinds of, yeah. How does like scarcity, because scarcity like often affects how much things cost. Mm -hmm. So it rare, in, in, in an actual fact, it rarely affects us. If, if something is scarce, you can get it or you'll pay more for it. But for the bulk of transactions, where people meet their needs, um, where things are brought to market by multiple suppliers and the whole thing is transparent, it doesn't really, like, it, that, it that doesn't skew the process much. So there may be a situation, but yeah, look at the 19th century again, like my expertise here. You get situations where everybody, scrambling to find <clears throat> ship trackers that, for provisions in the market in New York. And then somebody through a cousin gets a letter ahead of time that there is a shipment underway and that their company um, already has papers that put a claim on half of it. So they can then start selling these ship trackers at a, at a price that beats out others. Um, they can make a, an arbitrage profit from that. But how often is that going to happen once the situation is that um, supply catches up to demand and there are multiple suppliers that are regularly serving the market and so forth? Sure, then you'll have um, external factors like that ship that sank with gold from San Francisco and precipitated the 1857 economic crash, for instance, because people were scrambling for for means of exchange. Um, but that doesn't really affect the basic logic of this, so, which is uh, dealing with the exchanges that do take place, you know, mm -hmm. routinely. But that's a, an important question. Other questions? Yeah. I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding is. Mark saying that value is tied exclusively to labor time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How does he account for things having different value? Like back to your sandwich analogy, uh -huh. maybe I'm, I have like a secret sauce in my sandwiches that make them uh -huh. taste better. To the, people are willing to pay more money. To the extent, yes, you're assuming a Oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm dangling on this. This is because it is the hour after lunch. <laughs> We're repeating the, the current voter theory of economics is the not rational choice, not multiple choice for sure. Um, oh, marginal utility theory, whatever I think. So, where it is really that people in each instance make up their mind. What's it worth it to me? Is it worth the effort and so forth? What makes me suspicious about that is the argument its proponents have that they say, well, this is superior to Marxist and Smith's labor theory of value because these have to assume that they know what's going on in the minds of the market participants and that they assume that they're, you know, basing it on labor. How do they know? We know it is based on these contingent considerations that wild can swing wildly and that are mostly subjective. Fine. Um, after the fifth beer, these same people will admit that actually what they're doing, if that applies to Marx and the labor theory of value, is the same thing. They also must assume that they can look into the into the mind, read the mind of the actor in the market. So the question is, in the long term, in the practice, does your theory amount to an explanation that makes sense of what's happening in the market or not? Um, that would be one thing. So that, is, that no theory will always make exact sense of every situation is also true. But um, if you have a product that has dubious quality, where the use value might be considered not that much better than another, and you can sell it for more because of some external thing that you can attach to it. Like say um, you have a secret sauce 
that people want to consume. Um, usually, that can be dissolved into the labor time that went into the marketing, into making sure that this is known. Um, because rarely ever does the material or the time required to make the thing uh, justify. So if you have like artisanal ice cream that is being churned on the spot from fresh ingredients, um, and that comes that comes with a certain yuppie cachet. And people will say, well, it's better than the stuff that is mass manufactured in a factory one block further down, half the price, sold from big buckets, you know, and looking artificially flavored and color. But of course, that does take less time. In that case, it is very clearly, you don't pay for more quality. You pay for um, the time it takes to actually churn that stuff on the spot um, with the locally sourced ingredients. But it is not necessarily better idea. So the idea that the the quality of the thing determines the problem. That is one that Marx would want you to um, forget about. Because in almost all cases, really what matters is, is it going to meet your need? And then um, for the person who sells it, is it, was it worth my time making it? But there is a division between these things. So you never pay for quality. Quality is not going to make but it's more expensive, only to the extent that the higher quality requires more work. Imagine, however, in the 19th century, when British manufacturers were producing better cloth more cheaply because they could do it more quickly, you know, better machines, more experience making it, like better educated workforce. So in that case, clearly, higher quality and lower price went hand in hand. But then with the tariff, you know, you end up having to buy American-made cloth, which is lower quality, and then artificially with the inflated price. So, but um, those are uh, good objections, and we should definitely revisit, like maybe collect some, and we'll talk about that as we get back on, on Wednesday. Mm -hmm.